aerosol generating procedures have become a focus of concern due to the potential risk of COVID-19 transmission. Within ophthalmology, there is a debate that phacoemulsification and vitrectomy are aerosol generating. We investigate phacoemulsification using a series of experiments and ultimately make some simple suggestions how to reduce this risk. The setup. To improve the accuracy, we use a human cadaveric corneal scleral model and to reduce variables, the phaco is in a fixed static configuration. Question one. Does phacoemulsification create aerosols? An Alcon Centurion system is used throughout, here with a 2.75mm incision and sleeve. With the aid of a 4K camera, backlighting and a dark background, the aerosol is clearly visible. Question 2. Is aerosolization affected by corneal moisture? The cornea is dried with a spear. The aerosol starts immediately. The video evidence confirms the hypothesis. Aerosol originates from the anterior chamber. Question 3. Does the size of the corneal section affect aerosolization? The left, a 2.2mm incision. The right, 2.75mm. Both with corresponding phaco prep sizes. With repeated testing, no aerosol is visible with the 2.2mm setup. Question 4. Can we reduce the aerosol produced with suction? A standard hospital setup with Yanka Sucker attached to a Venturi suction device set at 100% power. Using this device, the suction is inadequate. Question 5 Can a focused stream of air redirect the aerosol? The stream of air successfully redirects the aerosol away from the surgeon. The effect of dissipating the aerosol into the theatre would need to terminate. Any clinical device would require filtration to prevent an increased risk of infection. Question 6. What is the effect of HPMC? The HPMC very effectively prevents all visible aerosol. Washing this off. And then reapplying very effectively demonstrates this. Question 7. How frequently should the HPMC be applied? Repeated timing exercises confirmed the HPMC breakthrough time averaged 67 seconds with a standard deviation of 8 seconds. That concludes the series of experiments. What can we learn from this? Phaco emulsification produces visible aerosol, agreeing with the anecdotal evidence. Anecdotally, we see aerosol if phacoing in close proximity to the corneal section. In this series of videos, the aerosol was more apparent due to the specialist photographic and lighting setup. Secondly, the aerosolization is independent of corneal wetting and comes from the anterior chamber. We use a human cornea to better simulate the corneal biomechanics and corneal compliance, removing some of the confusion created by using plastic models. Now that aerosol has been demonstrated, we have some unanswered questions relating to this aerosol and the risk of COVID-19 transmission. Can viable SARS-CoV-2 particles be aerosolized in sufficient quantities to infect healthcare workers? To help answer this, we need to understand where is SARS-CoV-2 found in the eye? More specifically, for cataract surgery, is it present on the conjunctiva or the intraocular fluid? If it is present in either of these anatomical locations, in an asymptomatic patient, is the viral load sufficient to represent a risk? We also need to understand more about the aerosol. Is it predominantly made of aqueous humor or balanced salt solution? A review of the literature provides some practical suggestions. Eggers et al. show that in vitro, a 0.23% povidine iodine solution reduced coronaviral load by 99.9% .9 after 15 seconds. The standard solution used in ophthalmology is a 5% concentration. Suggestion 1. Standard surgical asepsis using povidine iodine 
reduces any theoretical viral load on the conjunctiva. A double application has also been shown to reduce the risk of endophthalmitis. The next pertinent question in order to stratify the risk of aerosol is, during cataract surgery, is the aerosol made of BSS or intraocular fluid? The majority of intraocular fluid is viscoexpressed before capsulorexis. After this step, it is possible to reliably flush out the remaining aqueous humour. OCT studies demonstrate in humans, the average volume of the anterior chamber is 0.17 mils with a standard deviation of 0.04 mils. Therefore, 99.7% of the population will have an anterior chamber volume of less than 0.29 mils. When performing IA, there is a dilution effect from the balanced salt solution. This follows the rule of first order decay. The graphical representation shows for 99.7% of the population, when 2.03 mils of BSS is circulated, the concentration is reduced to less than 1%. Conventional aspiration rates are between 20 to 40 cc per minute. Using the lower of these to achieve a less than 1% concentration would require 6 seconds of IA. Suggestion 2. Perform irrigation aspiration for a minimum of 6 seconds prior to starting active phacoemulsification. Having minimised any potential viral load, can we go further and minimise any visible aerosol? Our series of experiments have highlighted. Using a smaller wound size reduces visible aerosol. Using a Yanka sucker attached to a standard hospital suction was inadequate, but more comprehensive suction may be of benefit. A focused stream of air successfully redirects the aerosol, but the risk to the remaining theatre team of dissipating the aerosol into the room would need determining. The air would also need adequate filtration to prevent an increased risk of infection. Suggestion 3. A smaller wound size reduces visible aerosol. The videos clearly demonstrate how effective HPMC is at eliminating visible aerosol if applied around the main surgical wound. The series of timing experiments provide evidence that HPMC should be reapplied every minute during active phacoemulsification. Suggestion 4. HPMC should be reapplied every minute during active phacoemulsification. So in summary, we have four practical suggestions to reduce any potential risk from phacoemulsification during the COVID-19 period.